welcome to the second installment of our Visiting Artists and Lecture Series for the spring. I'm Meg Mitchell, currently the chair of the Visiting Artists Committee and faculty here at Florida State. Today we are going to welcome David Packer. He studied at the Bristol School of Art and received his MFA from none other than Florida State University back in 1994. Yeah. And since then he's going to do some really amazing things. Um, he sh including showing at the Goliath Clark, Gal Clark Gallery, the Kohler Art Center, Exit Art in New York, the Museum of Arts and Designs, and recently, this past fall, he was featured in Ceramics Monthly. So I'd like to let everybody give a big hand to David Packer. Thank you. Is that too loud? No. What is that? Is that good? Okay. Um, I just want to say a few words of thanks before I get into the uh, slides. Um, Holly Hennessey has been responsible for curating the show downstairs and for bringing me down to give this lecture. And um, Alice Palladino Craig and her staff have been great with putting the show together with the catalogue and the installation. It's also great to see some familiar faces among the faculty here. So it's a measure of their dedication as artists and teachers that I'm even standing here 17 years later. Um, I want to thank Robert Fichter for buying me lunch today. <laughs> um, my wife, Margaret Lanzetta, was unable to join me on this visit but I also want to acknowledge her continuing support. I want to thank my peers from when I was in the MFA program and remind them that the mutual aggravation of those crits was actually worth it. <laughs> Finally, I want to acknowledge an artist that I met while I was here, Robert Flynn, who became a dear friend in the ensuing years. Sadly, he passed away in 2007. So, I start, I start with a recent piece from 2009 called Bears That Dance. It is glazed ceramics, and each piece is about 30 inches long. The title is from a book uh, called Blood Meridian by Cormac McCarthy. One of the things that I try to do with my work is to, um, I, I like to be able to connect it with other parts <coughs> of the culture, so like other media, and you'll see this um, a little more as we progress. There are actually two major conceits that frame my work, points of reference that I move between. Um, this piece is part of the nature side. The other side, the other end of the, of the extremes, is industry. The best way to describe this is that my work is framed by these two ideas, but actually sits in the middle, cross-referencing and using elements from either side at the same time. What I'm trying to describe will I hope be illustrated by the next 40 minutes, or in the next 40 minutes or so. What these are, these are full-size ceramic sculptures of our V8 car engines. The piece is called The Last of the V8s, which is a line from one of the Mad Max films. Films that were made in the 80s and set in a, a sort of post-industrial future. I'll talk more about the piece in a minute, but first I want to talk about how and where the idea came from. So we're all right with the sound? This is enough? This is loud enough? <coughs> Even though I'm primarily a sculptor, sculptor, I've used photographic images extensively over the years and really consider myself as an image maker, or even, if you like, an image user. I look for an object that has the strength to become an image and to carry other associations with it. To resonate with other ideas is, is how I think of it. This is actually a photograph of a boat taxi in, in Bangkok. And what I find interesting is they, they use old car engines, removed from the vehicle and reused. It's not... A, it's not um, often that you actually see a car engine outside of the car, and the image had a power for me that I knew I could use. Car engines carry different associations, oil use, industrial culture, and so by extension American culture, and as the car engine comes under increasing <coughs> scrutiny, also nostalgia. As I said, the word that I like to use for this is resonance, in that a single object or image can reference other ideas. It's a long way from an idea, you know, like from looking at a car engine on a boat to actually making sculptures of it and drawing is my way in. It's not so much now that I'm going to make it's not so much that now that I'm going to make this engine, so much as the act of drawing and the time that it takes allows me to think about what I'm going to do. So I'm just making this drawing for as a drawing, but at the same time, I'm looking online, I'm, you know, I'm thinking about car engines, of what actually is a car engine. 
So, but this is, you know, to my mind, this is like a standalone piece. This is another drawing, a little later in the series, called uh, Sound of the Bell. The text is by Bruce Springsteen, who has plenty to say about car engines. What was actually interesting was, I had this piece in a show in Chicago, and the reviewer came in, looked at the piece, and didn't get, didn't know it was Bruce Springsteen line. So he talks about, you know, the sort of the workers' lament or whatever, whatever. And it was really rather perfect that he didn't know what it was. He just maybe he thought I'd written it or whatever, but it sort of added something to it that he was describing it without knowing it's the context. As you see, as you see from the uh, the original, the, uh, the earlier installation shot. This drawing obviously relates more clearly to the final manifestation of the idea of the installation. And in fact, what I was doing was, when I started making these engines, I was also trying to promote them at the same time, trying to get it out, get the idea out there. So this was not only a mock-up for me to figure out what I was doing, but you know, a way of getting the idea out there. In 2006, I was invited to have a residency at the Cola factory in Wisconsin. My proposal was to make um, sculptures of the, of, the, of the car engines. Not only had I been preparing for this project, and given the scale and the opportunities that you know, a factory like Cola offers the <coughs> you know, I knew, I knew this was going to be good, perfect. But also, I really liked the, the metaphor of making the industrial object in a factory, you know, rather than making art, even though this is art, I was, you know, I was making a car engine in the factory, so that, that had a nice little resonance, resonance for me. <coughs> the joke about Cola is that it's like, oh, it's a toilet factory. Well, it actually is a toilet factory. This is <laughs> kind of what they, you know. and, and the thing that was really cool, really cool about being there was that as artists, we had complete run of the place. You, know, you had your little security, because I mean, you can't just walk into this factory, but once you're in residence, you can do whatever you want there. So you can, you know, find out all, you know, see all the different places, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And the whole scale thing is really great. Because, like, for instance, this is, you know, this is the plaster. This is where they make, you know, the, you know, this is this is the amount of plaster they bring in, you know, every month, every week, whatever. So it's, you know, if like me, you have a sort of fascination with, you know, scale and factories and things like that, it's it's kind of a great place to be. This was actually my little workspace, and this is where I was, um, you know, where I spent three months making these engines. And in fact, behind, you know, through there, where, I don't know if you can see the sheet, sheet, excuse me, sheets there. That's actually the factory floor. I guess no one was working. It was probably at night or something. But that's so you were right in the factory when you're doing this. And I'm guessing this is early on because what what is on the table there is actually the model. So it's the first step of the process where you make a model. And this, this I made out of foam. So here's, here's the engine again. So, you know, it's big. It's because you know, car engines, V8s are big engines. So I think there's 10 different molds. I, you know, I, I knew at the time, I can't really remember now because I don't have the molds anymore. And 10 molds made 15 pieces that were then combined together <coughs> to make the finished piece. In keeping with the fact that this was a car engine made in a factory, I chose to have it. Um, Painted, not glazed. Another great story, so here's a detail, obviously. Another, another great story is that right next to where I was working, there was some engineering thing, and they're trying to figure out you know, how to engineer a toilet or whatever, because it's, it's, it's actually very complicated, all this. And halfway through, one of the guys comes up to me, because I walked in and said, oh, I'm going to make a car engine. You know, this is what I'm going to do. You know, this is my project. Halfway through, he walks up to me and says, we didn't think you were going to be able to do this. And of course, by then, I, I, had, I was, was doing it. So that was kind of, you know, I was kind of happy about that. I just took the engines out to Seattle this last summer. So that was kind of nice that it was this um, a city, one of the cities out there. And they had this great pavilion type space. There's actually glass on four sides. So, even though it was like bureaucrats doing this thing, they picked a great space for the, uh, for the sculptures. Uh, this is another riff on industry, and this, this piece is really, riff, uh, really recent, it's 2010. It's about uh, four feet long and finished with acrylic. 
one of the things about going to Cola was that it really spoiled me with scale because I was able to make big work. And so I'm still kind of trying to do that, even though, you know, in my little studio in New York. And what I do is, like, a piece like this is actually made separately and then attached. So this is called King Pigeon. The, the title is like, it's, it's a, I'm trying to, you know, it's a very industrial image, so I picked up something natural to uh, soften it a little bit. And again, it's the same thing. It's the nature and the industry, two, two poles that I was talking about. I made two of them, because, you know, you, you got to have two. This one's called Big Bird. Uh, with both these trucks, I'm trying to bridge the gap between industry and nature, and, I, and as you just said, with the title and the decoration. Uh, this is a this is um, this I made in 2002. It's called Earth Mover, and I just want to show it as a counterpoint to the previous pieces. So you know, it's the same theme, separated by years. This is smaller though, maybe 22 inches or so. It's um, hand-built ceramic, all glazed in separate pieces, and then assembled after firing. Uh, this was the year that I had the, my one-person show with the ceramic dealer Garth Clark. And in fact, just as a little aside, eight years later, I actually sold this to somebody. So I managed to keep it for eight years and then sold it. Now, now it lives in Paris, which is kind of cool. So. Oh, okay. um, again, drawings. You know, I mean, I have piles and piles of work on paper. So this is, again, what I was talking This is a little more literal in that I would actually like Xerox this and use that <coughs> as a template to figure out how to make these things. But also, uh, note, note the collage elements, which is a distinctive part of my work. Uh, part of the same series, these are called Fighting Elephants. So, and this piece is in, um, this is the piece that's in the Museum of Design in New York. This was the beginning of the sculpture series, and this was 19, 1999, and, that led, and this is what led to the pieces I've just shown, shown you. Prior to this, I'd been using images two-dimensionally. Then I decided to make, um, make the images in three dimensions. I've always been interested in warfare, and the Vietnam War had seen, has seemed to still be a part of the conversation. These are the helicopters that came to symbolize the Vietnam War, the Hueys, because these are like the utility helicopters. Uh, and this was actually the first piece that I showed with Garth Clark. So this, this was definitely a, just like the engines, this was like a, what I consider a watershed, like I suddenly like, you know, the penny dropped, and, um, and it led to a lot of other work after that. <laughs> this, right after the, right after those helicopters, I made the, um, I made these mosquitoes. Uh, from, to my, in my mind, the mosquitoes and helicopters had a lot of, um, a lot in common. So and I, 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 what I wanted to do was to be able to show them side by side. <coughs> I, 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 I talked about this briefly. Scale, in terms of making things big, has always been a goal for me. But relative scale is less important. Both the, helic both the helicopters and the mosquitoes are about 20 inches long. So, take up, so they take up the same amount of actual space. But I was presenting an image. And the lack of relative scale, since actual mosquitoes are smaller than helicopters, was not important. You know, what it's it's the it's the idea I'm trying to present. It doesn't matter that they're you know they're not realistically the same size. Also what I did is I had this piece photographed, you know, on astrotop obviously, and then had had a big, you know, print made of it, a big photographic, you know, inkjet print. So for me this is really interesting because then you know, what starts as an image became a sculpture and then went back to being an image again. And, you know, I, I love it, you know, it was like a big 40 by 50, so it was, you know, nice and big. This is another, obviously, another natural image, but this, for me, this is like, and I guess the mosquitoes too, it's nature as an irritant. You know, it's like, a, as, it's not like bucolic, it's, and that's definitely how I see it all the time. So nature as an irritant, I actually made 13 of these. You know, the number was very, very deliberate. These were, um, again, like the cola work, the, the body parts were actually cast, you know, cast ceramics. But this is, these are tiny. But, you know, since I have 13 of them, I could, I could achieve scale by, 
you know, doing it that, you know, putting them all together. Another helicopter. This is this is an Apache. So I mean, I'm, and basically, this is the this is the helicopter everybody's using now. This is what they used in Americans used in Somalia, like a Black Hawk Down. This is what Israel has. This is what they, they use in Iraq. So this is this is much more. Whereas the Vietnam, the Hueys, the Vietnam helicopters were kind of like the 60s helicopter. This is like the helicopter now. And this is all, you know, this is exactly how I'm intending this. You know, this is what's going through my mind when I'm, you know, thinking about making these. Um, this, is, this is about four feet long. It's actually a combination of ceramic and aluminum. And then I spray painted it and added decals on it. It's called uh, Flower Power. Oh, right. um, and what I want to do was, is actually, and I want to tie it back to Vietnam by using that title. Even though it's not the Vietnam helicopter, I just needed that. That was that was important to me. This is the previous incarnation of the same piece, because as you see again, as you as you'll see later, if I don't necessarily like a piece, or if I make it and then a couple of years later I want to change it, I do. You know, it's, it's very fluid, but not you know, set necessarily. This again, I had photographed, and I only ever showed this as a photograph. So, you know, it, it's it's just a big two-dimensional image. Of a sculpture. Okay, going now. This is going back a couple of years, 1999 again or well, thereabouts. Um, this is very typical of the graphic work that I have done over the years. What I was trying to do was collect different images of the same object as a way of thinking about them. And and as we'll see, I'm still using the same approach of collecting and cataloging. More of the same. This is actually a real collage, and like what I did. This, I mean, huh, this is before computers, really. So these are color xeroxes of photographs that I made, glued onto paper. So you know, so it's, it's a physical thing. It's not like you know, no computer was used with this. And that, you know, I would like you know use the xerox machine to get them, flip them around, and all that stuff, get them the same size. So it's much more, much more low tech because that's that's what I had back then. Obviously now. It's a little different. That's the that's where I ended up. That was the sculpture of the yeah. And I showed that at the same time as the, the, the blue piece of Mover and the fighting elephants. Uh, one of the one of the drawings. At this point, which I consider kind of early on, I was really using the drawings to figure out how to make sculpture. And with this particular piece, there's actually six or eight different drawings that I made. So I'd spend hours just like, you know, and you can see that I was like adjusting the sizes and you know, so on and so forth. There's another one. And again, I, the collage elements are really important. This is the, um, <clears throat> this is the beginning of the series that culminated in the piece that I have downstairs in the show. Trains clearly relate to many of the other subjects that I've chosen over the years, you know, industry and vehicles, but there's also a corporate angle that interested me, you know, how the needs of the individual are, subsu are subsumed by corporate activity. The scale idea is also is relevant here also, because I realized that I can make larger sculpture by putting several trains together. And, I mean, I did, the, I, I did trains over several years and kept, like, adding to them, because it's a train, so you keep adding trains to the train. Um, I, was I was attracted to, um, one of the things that attracted me initially was all the text that trades had. And I decided to make my own corporation, as you can see. That was, and then the same with the piece downstairs. By this time, the drawings had really loosened up, because I really didn't need, in the same way, the specific plans to make the sculptures. So the drawings would kind of just be more diaristic and note-taking as I was in the studio. But again, it's really, I really, you know, you can see the, the importance of the, that original photographic image. Okay, that's just a detail of the piece. I mean, I, you know, I mean, to, me, to my mind, you know, the whole thing about, you know, my name being on it, I find it hilarious. It's kind of like, you know, I'm in my studio laughing to myself about doing this. So that's a lot of time down there. Um, <laughs> 
again, more, more, more drawings. I, I, I deliberately pulled out slides of drawings that I don't have downstairs, just so you see, you know, how much of this stuff there is. Um, I love this corporate text. This is really what it's working on. What, um, what, what, what intrigues me, or one of the things that intrigues me. This was, this is six of the train cars at Exit Art in 2005. So, I mean, for those of you who don't, don't know, Exit Art is a really venerable non-profit space in New York. So, to be in a show there was, you know, was kind of great. And the other thing that I liked is they just looked at these and they're like, well, this is sculpture. We're going to put it on the floor. Okay. No pedestals, no, you know, nothing, you know, nothing, you know. So, that was cool. And... It was just nice that they, they just looked at it as, you know, as the way it's intended, as, as an image. And then, you know, you've all seen this one. That's the, uh, that's the image. Yeah, that's the piece. Well, one of them in the show. You see, the thing about what's cool about these trains is you can just keep, you know, varying them. You can put any one with any other one. It's not like a set, a set way of doing it. This is the precursor which I did like the year before the one you saw downstairs. This was 2005, 2006, sorry. It's called um, Ghost, Ghost Shipping. So, and again, I was specifically thinking about all the secrets that corporations have. So, another jump. Um, um, I had to, um, I had to include work that I made while I was a grad student. It kind of seemed appropriate to like, drag some of it out. This is called Ghost Rose, Ghost Rose number one. It's 1993, and it's some um, Xerox images of photographs of roses attached to found plexiglass. It's about 18 by 14, and what I, where I was, I, I'd really been working off the work of the Star Twins, that sort of thing. And this was actually like a photo, like um, Xerox negatives, which I'll talk about a little more later. So it's very um, non-traditional photography, but still, you know. Using, photogra using photographic images and photographic processes. Funnily enough, it's only when I was doing this presentation I realized that this piece, which is 1993, and the piece before, which is 2006, both have the word ghost in it. So, and I think it's, again, it's about the idea of hiding or subverting. That's why I was using it. This is the, uh, another piece, Ghost Rose 2. And, you know, it's got masking tape and electrical tape on it. This is the same... This is, um, you know, an, another manifestation of the same thing of nature and um, industry. This, um, this I made after grad school, so I, right, after, right, after, right after I graduated, I moved to New York and I kept working in the same vein, so I thought that was kind of, you know, that's, to my mind, interesting that I was still running through with these collage type <coughs> images. What I like now is that when I look at this, you know, I realize that collage is just another form of sculpture for me, because in this piece, you know, it's, it's strongly image-based, but it uses wood, ceramic, metal, Xerox, and photography, all in common. And I, I and, and you know I continue to see um, my two-dimensional work as very sculptural. This is again another piece that I did maybe two years out of grad school. It's called Age of Giants. These are all my own photographs, and I, I make that distinction very specifically. Um, Xerox from contact sheets of two and a quarter negatives, and then mounted on plywood. So again, they kind of had, the, you know, it was like an inch and a half of wood, so you could see the edge. So they had this sculptural quality to them. This is called Fish Rot at the Head. Fish Rot at the Head. And I think I just wanted to show this piece because I love that title. Just, just works. More, more in nature and industry in combination and crossover. I was talking about these earlier. These are photographs pr printed directly from Xerox images, mounted on plywood. Um, each panel is about 17 by 22, and this, this is conceived as a single piece, not three pieces, it's one piece. Um, 
when I was here, I said this before, when I was here I was doing a lot of image making with Xerox negatives where I'd take an image, make a negative of it on, on a piece of Xerox paper and then print it directly. So it's this, I, I don't even know how I came up with this idea if someone probably told me to do it. But So very, you know, so I love the whole, you're losing, the image is getting lost through the, uh, through the process. Um, this piece, some of these are my own photographs, but some of these are also appropriated. And in fact, what's interesting is that in 1996, I wasn't really, the, the internet wasn't really a place to um, appropriate from, so most of these actually come from um, magazines. This kind of represents the, this is 1996, as, as I said, and this kind of represents the end of the work that I started, you know, when I got here in grad school in 1992. And after this, it was when the sculpture started. So when I, you know, and hopefully you can see that these images, you know, I'm starting to make sculpture of similar, of similar stuff. So, um, another big jump. This is uh, 2007, but I think, again, I feel like there's a lot of connections with what I've just showed you. Um, I spent six months in India, because my, my wife had a Fulbright, so, so we went together. And what I did is I filled my suitcase with paper that would fit in the suitcase. So, and then I took all these images that I've been collecting over the years, you know, photographs, magazines, you know, collage stuff. Because uh, I didn't really know if I was going to be able to make sculpture there, so I kind of wanted to get to India with stuff to make art. You know, what was interesting about spending so long in India was everyone thinks, oh my God, it's so busy. But you know, especially as a foreigner, you know, Life can be quite isolating, so you actually you're forced to spend quite a lot of time on your own, and so it's a real, kind of a really great place to, um, you know, reevaluate and you know think, <coughs> think about my practice. And it was certainly you, you're going to see quite a lot of this paperwork. It was certainly um, you know a good place to sort of plan the next step. The, um, the quote there is um, it's Shakespeare, it's King Lear. Um, each of the following pieces is 13 inches by 9 inches, so you know, middle size, and it usually includes three distinct images. This piece concerns empire, anarchy, and greyhounds. And that's kind of how I'm thinking about it. Like, that represents that. You know, that. Obviously, there's more associations, but this is why I have them. This is um, greyhounds again, medieval dogs and weapons. This is mining, Vietnam, and helicopters. This is cell phone towers, the ocean, and Vietnam helicopters. I ended up with about 35 pieces, all with collected images and some, some images that I've taken in India. Actually, like the top two are um, images I, I, I took while I was there. This combination of these pieces I, I've, I've started to refer to as a hard drive, because we all keep stuff on hard drives. And this notion, this hard drive notion, is becoming a sort of major organizing factor in my, in my image files. And, you know, and in my work as it goes forward. This is the last one of these series, of these, these pieces, that they, you know, this size in, that I did in India. Um, this is actually the text of, um, of um, Alan, Alan Ginsberg's poem, How. I'd read Carol, Kerouac years ago, but I didn't discover how until I came here. So it's also great to read in New York. The bats were internet images, as I was thinking about making bat sculptures, and so, and so I'd been collecting images of bats. Um, the reason why I picked a bat is it's the same as the ant, it's like nature of greed. So. This is one of the sculptures I did, this is called um, Painted Ladies, and it's actually it's a wooden shell, with little ceramic bat heads, and then Xeroxes of bats. And you know these the, the bad images are um, found online. You know, I didn't I didn't pay. I take whatever I find. I don't care about any of that. This is a larger. This is a larger bat sculpture. By then the bat the bat got a little bit more benign. What happens in India is they, they, there's a lot of um, processing of images where they take their their, their um, sculptures of gods and they move them around and all this stuff. So this was my. This is what I did here. So this is kind of like me with the bat, with the vehicles, which I've always done, and all combined together. So, and the head is um, actually cast uh, stainless steel. 
uh, from bats, I moved on to sharks, but I wanted to put him on, you know, I wanted to put him on a vehicle to make, to, to, just to compromise the nature a little more. The species is called Nature Moor, and it's about 55 inches long. I'm trying to do this in 40 minutes. Um, this was a smaller piece. I, I had all the pieces that I did in India, and then I, you know, I got them really quickly, so I started doing smaller pieces. And a lot of these I did while we were traveling, so I'd like, do them in hotels, so like, instead of like collage thing going on in hotels. And this is much more about India, Indian stuff. These are, um, this is called um, Ma Ma Mandala, and it's actually like old um, tobacco wrappers that I picked up and made them. So it's like, this is my thing about how spiritual and messy India is at the same time. So it's, it's like a um, this is, a, for me, a very typical image of India that became part of the hard drive project. Because what I found when I was doing was, I was constantly taking photographs of the same things. So I realized that this was significant. So that's why, you know, and electrical wires was something that I kept taking photographs of. The other, another, thing, <clears throat> another thing I collected um, was wild dogs, or feral dogs. So, and, I mean, I took two or three hundred photographs of dogs like this, all over the place, because they are all over the place. And um, because I had so many dog images, I'd make subdivisions of the dog. So this is a dog sleep. So I'm sort of like making subcategories of the category. What, what's important is that this organizing is not just about making a catalog, so much as it's reflecting the way I see the world and the connections that I make. So. You know, the organization is symptomatic of what I'm doing. Makes sense. This is the sculpture that came out of those photographs. These are all um, these are all made out of um, plywood. So um, what I did is I specifically because you have all these dogs living in cities, so I specifically picked construction materials to make the dogs. So that you know you've got a natural thing that's actually made out of. Our, our job. So it's scraps I had around the house, or, or stuff I'd find, whatever, whatever. And that's just a little, you know, it's just one of them. That's called um, Pretty. I think that dog is pretty. So I realize I'm running out of time a little bit. This was, um, wood was another departure for me, and it was very interesting to change media. What happened was, I, um, this is, um, this is a view of my studio at an artist residency called Yardin in upstate New York. And what happened was I had to make a body of work for a show. So it was perfect to kind of like hole up in, um, in Yardin and make these for, the, for a show. This is called, um, this is called The Chief. And this is like the leader of the, uh, this, this is what I made at Yardin. I made seven of these guys. These are, these are Humvees from Iraq. So I'm, I'm back on the wall thing again. And, you know, when I look at this, I don't really see any distinction between this and the ceramic vehicles, except for the content. Yeah, it's just a, it's a sculpture of a vehicle. Uh, what I like is that all these, all these vehicles, in, in reality, are slightly different depending on what they do. So, I also made, um, um, these are called tow tractors, and these are the things that pull aeroplanes. So, uh, I mean, I'm not quite sure what the relationship with Iraq was, but I, I just, I'd seen these, so I was like, oh, this is totally cool. I've got this sort of work vehicle thing going for me. Here are the Humvees. The, the, I had a solo show in Chicago in 2007, and here, here are the Humvees at that show. So, the show was called Hearts and Minds, which was a famous phrase that the uh, administration used about you know, trying to win the hearts and minds of the Iraqi people. Another view of the uh, of the pieces. Again, it's great. Excuse me, but they're on the floor. <coughs> this was in the following year. I took the same pieces to Minneapolis, and I did an installation in um, a place called the Soap Factory, and I just built this bridge. I really like this photo. I have no idea who the guy is, but it's just a great shot that they sent me. So. And here's a clearer view of what I did. So I put the, you know, the same vehicles just on this 
on this rickety bamboo bridge. Um, I, 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 you know, for me this is some some sort of a procession. Well, you know, and the orange flags. You see the three orange flags. That has, you know, for me that had a sort of religious connotation too. These are the um, these are the engines uh, in that same show in Chicago. So I had three. The show was had the show was called Hearts and Minds, and there were three distinct elements in it: the Humvees, some hearts that you'll see in a minute, and the V8 engines. Even though the engines refer to the mind part of the title, they could also refer to the heart. Because, you know, so I'm consciously like just like making these associations of them just you know, and then images take on different associations. This, this is, um, I know I want, you know, I, I knew the I kind of had the title before I had the sculpture, interest, you know, so this was me just playing around with the whole heart thing. And these are just little, um, you know, I print out little things, little name, words and print on paper. So, in a way, this is, to, in a way, this is kind of like the end game drawing, because ten years ago I was making these detailed little plans of how to make a sculpture. Now when I make a sculpture, it's just, you know, these are the words, so. Same thing, bigger. This is actually written as opposed to collaged. These are the hearts in Chicago, so there's three of them. And I never really liked how the piece looked. I mean, you know, there's the show. I'm very happy, I've got a nice review, whatever. But the piece is kind of, you know, I took them home and I was like, you know, I thought I wanted to do something. So what happened is this summer, I had them repainted. And I actually took them to them. To an auto store or auto you know, shop, and they, they spray painted them for me. And also, what I did is I made it so I could hang them. So now they're hanging from the ceiling, and they've got these holes sticking out of them. So for me, being able to like take a piece, show it, take it back, and you know change it is great. I love that that freedom you can sort of like you know, change the pieces around. Um, this actually to Miami this last winter for a run as part of our Basel. It's called um, Baldacchino, and I was just thinking, I, I don't have, you know, just thinking about Baroque images, like those clouds on top of those, I mean, the thunderbolts and stuff on top of, um, on top of altars in Italy, so that Baldacchino. This is the second one in the same <coughs> series, because there were three hearts in Chicago. This is called Corcorium which is Latin for heart of hearts. It's actually it's the inscription on the grave of Shelley in Rome. And there's some weird story that you know, when they, they had to burn his body because he had something or other, I forget, some you know, plague or something. So his wife pulled his heart out. A few more I thought that was a great story. This is the third heart in the series. This is called Andy's, Ru Andy's Rubies. And actually, I used to, I had, there was an ad called Andy's Rubies, so I uh, recycled the piece and recycled the title. So, okay, this is the last image. Um, this is what I'm going to do next. And this is actually a plastic scarecrow. It's, a, it's an owl. And I'm going to cast it in ceramic and um, then paint it with auto paint. I don't know what color I'm going to... I just made the mold. I haven't struck any... I haven't cast it yet. But I, um, and right now I'm calling this... Um, the working title for this is The, uh, the Short Circuit of Nature. Okay, thank you. So, if anybody has any questions for the artist, he'd love to take some questions. I definitely, I definitely wanted to do that because I, you know, I thought 40 minutes is probably enough. So. I have a technical question. Sure. Um, when you hang heavy ceramic things like engines, what are your fixtures? Um, oh, like, oh, the engines? Like the engines, yeah. The engines, the there's one central piece. It's kind of like, you know, just one central piece. And what I did is, there's a sheet of, you know, it's, it's ceramic. The body is really strong. It's like a toilet. It's like a really high-fired, it's not porcelain. It's a really high-fired white body. It's just like your toilet. So it's virtually indestructible. There's a, basically there's bolts, there's three bolts supported with metal and wood in there, and then the, and then it's like, um, not, uh, it's like a hook, 
and then the chains just hook on, and they run through holes. And... Those engines aren't that heavy, maybe 150. So, you know, I mean, it's not as heavy as a real car engine. <laughs> so. Did you like being in India? I mean, other than the isolation? Yeah, yeah, well, that was just, a, I mean, I mean. Did you enjoy it? Yeah, India's amazing. India's kind of like the, it, to my mind, it's like the ultimate destination. Yeah, I because know. I enjoy your pieces, um, especially the one um, the battle in the pedestal room with like the umbrella behind it. Yeah, that was. Like, see, that's kind of like my like Indian piece. Reference. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what? You know what? For me, is interest. What is? What I try not to do is. I don't want to like go to India and make Indian work. You know, I was really res for the first three months. I was really resisting that. Idea. Yeah. I was just trying to make my own work or or filter it through my own thing, but. It kind of, um, you see, I made that like six months after I got back. You know, the same with the dog, so it kind of keeps on, you know, cycling through. But... No, India's, India's amazing because it's, you know, it's so spiritual, in spite of all the, you know, the pollution and whatever, whatever. It's just everywhere. It's, it's like little shrines. You know, it's, it's aggravating and amazing. It's kind of um, your your painted ladies, uh, that piece is that in, in relation to the painted ladies like butterfly? I was just wondering about the title. No, you know what? It's it's um. Shakespeare uses it, and don't ask me which to describe prostitutes as painted ladies. Oh yeah, that one. <laughs> All right. So I, I, I have no idea which play it is, and I'm but I'm pretty sure it is. So. Because there's a painted lady's butterfly, and I was wondering who's. What that. is he? Is that the name of the butterfly? Yeah. Oh, okay. And it's not a very attractive butterfly, and I always thought it was funny because it's. No, I'll, I'll say I'll take that as a uh, as a reference. Maybe that's what Shakespeare was talking. About. Well, I, I thought because bats eat like moths and butterflies and stuff like that. I didn't know that. Okay. That's all right. That's all right. Yeah. <laughs> I wonder about the number of like objects you made. Like you had, like five engines and three hearts and. You know, like 13 Humvees and... Yeah, you know, yeah, it's, I mean, um, <coughs> it's usually an odd number, because odd numbers look better. <laughs> right, it's true, though. Yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah. With the ants, 13 is, un, is an unlucky number, so that was just like, and I, again, I was going, they were small, so I was going to scale. The engines... The thing about that project is once you have a mold, it's relatively easy to make the, the pieces. So you can like, so again, I, I, you know, because you can make, you know, I mean, I was there for 12 weeks. It took me six weeks to make the molds. So then halfway and I haven't got made a single piece. But then once you have them, you can bang out the pieces. Yeah. So I, have a, so I have a question about that. When you think about making them, um, pieces from a mold and you make as many as you want to produce, how do you think about it? Do you think about it in terms of um, additions um, or do you think about it in terms of I'm making five and that's a complete piece or mm -hmm. how, and how do you think about it in terms of um, even showing and keeping the work because the more you make the, the larger, I don't know, those sort of I Questions think, are... you know, with the engines, there are actually, I actually have six in my studio. So, in Chicago, I showed three. The, the first image I showed you, there were five. But there are actually six. I think I think of them as individual pieces. I have an addition. That's, I mean, what I have is what I have, because I broke the molds when I left the I mean, because... I mean, the engine's taking enough space, God knows I can bring the molds up too. And I couldn't, I couldn't recreate that. I think it's, I mean, for me, it's like, done, fine, I'm not going to do that again. You know. Okay, so I have one more question. Okay, that's all right. No, it's fine. <laughs> so, for what, say, some of the smaller ones, that, like the, some of the smaller trucks, do you at one at, do you at some point decide I've made twelve and now I'm going to destroy the molds? You see the trucks on them. 
made in a mold. Oh, okay. Well, what, if you have something else that's made in a yeah, mold. Yeah, well, like for instance, there's ants. Okay. I'm not going to make any more ants. Okay, so do you destroy the mold, or how do you decide? I usually, I mean, I, I think I kept those molds for several years, and I was like, It's also kind of like, for me, you know, been there, done that, you know, I would like to do something else. I mean, oftentimes I still have the pleasure of these pieces. So that's even more reason to break them all, because I still have them. The ants were all gone, so that was nice. But there was one other number thing I was just trying to think about with the... But usually, the, you know what, just to go back to your question, Usually there's some significance in terms of like why I do that, but the uh, but the uneven number thing is important. It just kind of looks better. As far as coloration in your pieces go and color scheme in general, when and how do you decide on that? Because it it's seems like it's, it's really hard. Okay. It's really hard. When do I decide? Well, usually when I have to. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I'm definitely into this monochromatic thing. <coughs> yeah. You see, like, for instance, I mean, with these, I, I envision, I was thinking the other day, maybe I'll do, like, ten shades of grey. Because actually, this car paint is like a whole other world. Because I can go in with a Pantone number and get a paint that matches it, so it's really pretty cool. So I can pick the colors in Photoshop, go into the store, get the paint, and go to the house. I was thinking of the... <coughs> Ten, ten grays. I don't know. It's all going to be monochromatic, though. So it's really going to change because this has got the goofy, naturalistic colors of the of the uh, you know the You know they sell these things. I have another question related to color and and the ideas behind it. The trucks and, and those are have really bright, punchy colors, and then. Some of your natural things had more muted colors. So can you talk about the colors? Which are the natural things? I was just thinking about the ants. What, what colors they were, were they? Were they red? They were all red. red. Okay, okay. So, so I just You see, you know what it was back then? I was using glazes. So all that stuff from 99, 2004 was all low-fire glazes. And that's kind of like... Kidding. I mean, that's almost as much fun as the auto paints because you know, you've just got the colors and they all work. You know, it's really easy to do and stuff. So, but for some reason, there's always, you know, you know what it is? It's I, I, you know, the object's realistic enough, realistic enough in itself, so I don't really want to add any more to the realism with the coloring. I think that's what it is. So I'm trying to, like, you know, maybe do something different. Uh, I have a question. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about how the exotic fi factors into your work conceptually. The exotic in, uh -huh. uh, in that. Well, it's, um, I'm wondering if, you know, maybe in some of your work, nature seems like something that's exotic or, you know, going to. I'm just, I mean, do you ever think about uh, the exotic? Not really. No. I mean, <laughs> No, I think I mean I mean I think I'm, you know the nature stuff is it's more like it's more like based on what they do, my perception of what they do. Uh -huh. Like ants bite and crawl over you, mosquitoes bite you, fly around, sharks. Are, you know. I think it's I, I, I think what I'm trying to do is like like really mix up the nature industry thing. So that the you know so like that shark was painted industrial grey. So I'm, uh -huh. and, you know and so trying to ascribe natural qualities, no, um, industrial qualities to natural things. Because industry is invasive of nature. Say that again? Because industry is invasive of nature, or, I mean, is that, is that a... That's some, that's part of it. I'm, I, I think it's more like just, I, I think what's, what's interesting to me is kind of like that, what it is, is it's actually, the, it's the space in between, like the stage, gray area, there's lots right. of different words. Like where they meet. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And things have different you know, so like, like this guy's gonna be, you know, it's a natural owl, but he's gonna be painted all automotive looking. 
Yeah. You know, and then it's and then I put this object into the world and see what happens. So I'm just I'm just sort of pulling from both sides. And the thing about it is is that what I realize is that the more I work, the more my work stays the same. It's the same old I've, this, I've only got like two ideas, it seems. <laughs> You're just like sort of going round and round and round looking at the same, so maybe three. I've heard obsession works. Say that again. I said I've heard obsession works. Oh, maybe that's it. Yeah. But I, 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 I personally, as an artist, it's kind of like you're just sort of like, you know, moving around the same thing all the time. I'm just trying to make, you know, make it in different ways. Yeah, at the back of that. I know you had, I'm sorry, I know you had a question too. Uh, I was just curious, like, when you go back and kind of repurpose like, some work, like, what kind of pushes you and influences you, like, throwing a certain direction? Like, the firepower of helicopter, how it went from being kind of just this muted, you know, very strong to, like, something very colorful. I think in that, in that, in that instance, what it was is that I knew that was a great time. That was exactly the title of that piece. Was it the original title? Yeah, yeah, because I don't know if you saw it. There was actually a painting of a rose on the side of the black one. So the title was exactly what I wanted for that piece, but it wasn't really working. And it's probably two, I mean, I forget, it's probably two years between the, those two manifestations. It's funny, it's, it's amazing. I can show those two slides. And if I don't say it's not the same piece, people don't even notice. People think I'm really productive. <laughs> so, I was, uh, I was, since I'm, um, you know, since I'm back here, I'm being honest. <laughs> oh, what is it? One more. You had a question, right? Um, you, you said you're talking about war with a lot of the vehicle things, and um, because. You really faithfully capture what they really look like, but at a smaller scale, it, re it references toys more for me. Um, yeah, you know, I know there's a bit of a correlation with those things anyway, but because you said that you want to combine the industry with the natural, um, just, it might be interesting to put like mosquito wings on a helicopter, or you know, oh. mix it up a bit. They, oh, they're oh. really <laughs> so accurate, <laughs> but. How is that different from making a model? I don't, I don't know. I don't know. I might be too rigid with that. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. The Huey helicopter 60s that did represent the Vietnam War, and the flower power was our hippie side against the war. Girls would stick the flower deck. Right, right, right. In right. The room. And to see you put that on this modern day helicopter, our same generation now is still fighting the war, but flower power. Well, you see, what killed me was no one, I mean, you know, I know there was no draft you know, for Iraq. No one, no one, you know, Bush said we're going to Iraq, and everyone's like, yeah, fine. You know, there was no serious, to my mind, no serious opposition, and it killed me. It's kind of odd, though. I think it's kind of humorous and satirical that you put flowers on the modern day. Oh, yeah, no, I, I mean, uh, you know, I mean, I, I alluded to that earlier. I mean, if I don't amuse myself in the studio, no one else is going to. They look very designy too, like like that pattern might be found on a purse, um, which I think is interesting too, because well, that's where we would see it in you know contemporary lines. Yeah. Right. Right. Commercial lines. It's yeah. it's about subverting, you know. I mean, it's about taking that, you know, what I consider a fairly powerful image, that helicopter, and subverting it in a way. And then so you're forced to look at it as well. It's still a helicopter, but what else is it? Looking at the most beautiful images in the world are trucks and tanks and helicopters and fighter planes. Yeah, oh yeah. They but always have been to guys, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> you see, the, 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 uh, the serious answer to that is that it, it's just like, you know, it's incredible technology. But then you see, it's, it's technology used for, you know, the most um, base and um, basis of activity. Um, that's kind of, you know, when it, you know, that's the serious line. Yes? These, uh, many years later, what impact did any of your voice, the score, say, hold for you today in the studio or graduate school? <laughs> oh, yeah, is there a line that we're going to write for seminars, yeah. Um, <laughs> 
know, you know, you know, I got here, I got here at really, at really the perfect time in my life. I was actually a little older than some of the students. I was in my early 30s. So, and I, I'd already been an artist in Miami. I had galleries and the whole thing. So I came in with a little bit of art world experience, whatever. And it was just, you know, for, personally it was just a good time to be here. And the program was, um, I was in a really good year. You know, was, you know, a really good bunch of people. Also, the other thing that happened is that it was, um, the program was really consciously multimedia. And there was this joke, you'd come in as one thing and leave as another. And that was the same. <laughs> well, the thing about it is, is that, I mean, see, I was thinking about that, you know, I mean, it's funny coming here to do this thing, because you sort of think about, you know, what you're going to say and whatever, whatever. But I was thinking in a way that, you know, maybe in a way, what, you see, I think that that's the true, making work out of different things is the true way to be. And I was kind of thinking, maybe that's because we have computers now, because you kind of like, the computer's like the matrix, and then everything like pops off. Because every piece, ever since I've had a computer, every piece uses the computer in some way or another. No question. So maybe now that, you know, and I'm not making computer art per se, but I'm certainly using my computer all the time. So maybe the, you know, maybe that's, maybe it's because everybody has computers that they just bounce off with different media depending on what they're doing. Have you thought about um, collaging within your sculpture, like taking the hobbies and maybe um, putting like, I don't know, like, um, like the kind of monochromatic, like, yeah, so or like flower-esque things or nature-esque things on them, <coughs> I don't know, like incorporating it? Well, I did, I, I did that with the helicopter. You did do it with the helicopter? <laughs> I know, you know, each piece gets treated differently. That's the thing. So did I answer your Florence State question? Oh, what kind of porcelain did you use for the pieces? You said... No, it's, you know a cola? No, it wasn't porcelain. No. It's actually a... It's a casting body, so it's slim. It's casting slim. And it's actually a... It's actually a cone ten white casting slim. It's not porcelain, because porcelain is a specific kind of clay. Right. So, porcelain is the same thing, it's like cone 10, and it's white, but that cola body is not. So, I mean, everyone says, oh, it's porcelain, and I'm like, well, actually, it's not porcelain. So. But that's really big, you know, I mean, that kind of rigor is, you know, I usually, you know, I'm, not so I'm not so interested in that side of what I'm doing. I know about it, but I'm not so interested in it. So. What's your favorite work? What's my favorite work? You, you know what, I, I, I kind of alluded it to a little bit, it's this, this every, every so often you have a piece, you do a piece that you get a bump from. Like the three little helicopters, the Hueys, that was a bump. I said water shit earlier. Um, the engines was a bump. You know, you do these things and you're just like, you know, people look at you differently, you look at things, you know, so you, and then you sort of move on. You see, like, like for instance, the engines means I could probably never make anything really small. <laughs> So, so, so I think I'm, I think I'm just sort of like I don't think I have a favorite piece so much as just that I, I can acknowledge that certain pieces were, you know, important in my in my progression. 